Coming up, Spirit Rangers by Netflix will hit the streaming platform in October. We visit with the show's creator. Plus, hear how the tradition of fire management is being revived for Kaduk women. And is social media changing the campaign trail? I am Aaliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Amarawahopa, thank you for joining us. We start north of the Medicine Line, where Cree communities are in mourning after a series of stabbing attacks. Early on Sunday morning of Labor Day weekend, Royal Canadian Mounted Police received their first call. By the end of the day on September 4th, 10 people were dead and at least 18 injured. The series of knife attacks and stabbings happened mostly on the James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Officials say two suspects have been identified. One of them was 31-year-old Damien Sanderson, who was later found found dead near a house on the Cree Nation. The other suspect is 30-year-old Miles Sanderson. As of Wednesday morning, authorities say Miles is still at large and may have been wounded. One of the victims of the fatal stabbings was a crisis counselor. The brothers of Gloria Lydia Burns spoke to the media to share their sister's story. She, she was a first responder, so she responded to a call and she was in the wrong place, the right place at the wrong time. She was there to help people. And that's what she was. She was a helper. And she did her best to help people and she paid the ultimate price. The brothers blamed drugs and alcohol for the attacks, saying they felt partially relieved that one of the suspects had been found. I want the world to know, and I want the world to know that in every native community across Canada, there are good people in there. This is a random act of, of, of violence by people who were not in the right mind. There are a lot of good people in our community. There are a lot of good elders in our community. Authorities say an investigation into the cause of the attacks is ongoing, and Canadian border security has been notified in case Sanderson tries to flee into the United States. Staying with news in Canada, more than 200 people gathered at the Manitoba Legislative Grounds last week. The group attended a candlelight vigil for an Indigenous woman whose family members called her a sweet person with a kind heart. APTN's Tamara Pimentel has the report. 20-year-old Michaela Gerard Rusin has been identified as the victim of a homicide in Steinbach, Manitoba. At a young age, Rusin attended Ross Brook House, a non-profit drop-in center in Winnipeg. She later became a staff member and graduated from Rising Sun High School. Ross Brook House took to social media to share stories. A post reads, she was part of our powwow and programs for many years. We will always remember her as outgoing, smiling, and singing at our Christmas parties. Ruth Sin was last seen on Thursday. By Saturday, RCMP responded to a call about a homicide at a home in Steinbach, south of Winnipeg. Upon arrival, the suspect, 20-year-old Josh Benoit, had fled in his vehicle. Further investigations led officers to believe Rufsin was with him. When he was located, Benoit was arrested before his car caught on fire. RCMP believe he started the fire while being pulled over. After the fire was extinguished, the vehicle was searched, but Rufsin's body was later found on a remote ATV trail. Benoit had been charged with first-degree murder. Garrison Siti, Grand Chief for Manitoba, Kuitanawi, Okamaknak, says more work needs to be done to protect women from gender-based violence. He's calling on allies to help advocate for calls to justice implemented in the MMIW National Inquiry. In a statement, 
He says, it is a basic human right to live without fear of violence, threats, and abuse. The ongoing legacy of our women being tragically taken through acts of violence is an unacceptable product of colonialism that impacts all of us. Benoit has been remanded into custody. Major crimes and forensic identification services continue to investigate. Rusin's family is asking for privacy while a sacred fire is held in her honor. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Now to California, where Indigenous leaders are gearing up for another rally to protect their homelands. Eurostock, located in Northern California, has served as a sacred site for the Amamutsin for thousands of years. It is under threat of being destroyed from a proposed sand and gravel mining operation that would take up more than 400 acres. A draft environmental impact report showed the mine would damage cultural and biological resources and air quality. There are different efforts to address the project. Over 20,000 people have signed onto a petition to stop the mine. Tribal leaders say this is important to them because they are currently in a 60-day public comment period. On Saturday, September 10th, the Tribal Nation will host an in-person rally in San Jose. There are various leaders slated to attend, including elected officials, elders, and allies. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, the role of keeping the forest healthy and clean around the Kaduk homelands was once the duty of the women. We'll see how they are reviving this important role. But first, an interview you don't want to miss. We'll talk with the creator of Netflix's Spirit Rangers. We'll be right back. In 2020, Netflix announced a new all-native fantasy adventure series called Spirit Rangers. The animated show is finally set to be released in October. Carissa Valencia is the creator of the project, and she joins us today to preview the show. Welcome, Carissa. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So it's been quite the process to get to this moment. Maybe tell us at a high level what it's been like to not only create the show, but now be very close to the finish line. Oh my gosh. I, this has been a labor of love. Um, I can't wait for everyone to see our hard work. Animation takes a very long time. I've been on the show for about three years now and I just can't wait for everyone to see all our hard work. I keep saying like we've assembled the native Avengers of Hollywood to work on this. We have like natives at every single department and just like you can feel the energy in the show. And I'm just so excited for everyone to see it. What is Spirit Rangers about? So Spirit Rangers um, follows a modern Native American family. They live and work in a national park. The kids have this secret that they're Spirit Rangers, which means they can transform into their own unique animal. And they go on adventures in their national park that they call home. So it's it's when they transform, not only do they physically transform, but the park that they live in also transforms. So at the risk of sounding like a millennial, it's like when an Instagram filter is over the park. So as soon as they transform, the thunderstorm that you see in the sky as a human is actually a family of thunderbirds in spirit park so we see that that connection to nature is really really important and like everything is alive everything is connected so i'm hoping that you know the next time a kid like kicks a rock or wants to kill a spider they're thinking about how everything is alive and has a purpose and a place and connected to our land Earlier, Carissa, you mentioned that you've uh, compiled what you call the Native Avengers crew to work on this show. Maybe tell us about some of the people behind the scenes who are making it come to life. Yeah, Um, I'm particularly proud of our all Native writing staff. That was something I told Netflix I really wanted even when I pitched the show. Um, And that is where like the heart of the series really lies. They took the time to like, you know, we were in a space together where they felt that we could talk about what it was like growing up as a Native kid. What were our challenges? What were we excited about? What was hard about it? What do we wish we saw when we were kids on TV? So they really allowed themselves to be vulnerable and brought their own cultures to the table because Spirit Park acts as like this magical hub where we'll meet California spirits, which is my tribe, the Shumash, but we'll also meet 
characters who are visiting and passing through the land from other areas. So it was really special that the writing staff could bring their own stories to the table. Um, Joey Clift, who we all know and love, is amazing. And when I wanted to make the family multi-tribal, I obviously went to uh, my tribe to ask for their permission. And Joey offered to ask his tribe and he did a big meeting with his elders and his tribe to ask for their permission. And they said, yes, we're so grateful. And both the Shumash and the Cowlitz have been amazing collaborators on this process. Um, and now the kids are representative of like, not all natives look the same. So when we, we're designing the characters, they have different skin tones, different hair colors, different eye colors. So by being able to do that, it's been it's been such a joy to show just like a beautiful native family. So I'm really grateful to Joey for doing that for us. You know, something that really strikes me is that 25 years ago, children turned on the television and they were able to watch, you know, whatever animation was on TV. But nowadays, children turn on streaming services like Netflix. Maybe talk about what those early conversations were like with Netflix and how excited they were to um, maybe work on a project like this. Yeah, I think like this has been a really exciting time because it is long overdue to see our stories. Um, I think they were really excited about the idea that this is perfect for the preschool audience. It's basically like Grimm's fairy tales, but with a native twist. And we have so many of our own stories like that. So it was the perfect place for a preschooler to like literally walk in someone else's shoes or walk in someone else's paws, I guess, like feeling the earth that way, learning about their place that way. So it's an exciting time. When can we actually turn Netflix on and watch this show and how many episodes will it be? <laughs> okay, mark your calendars. October 10th, Indigenous Peoples Day. 20 episodes will be up. Um, they're 11 minutes long. And I think it'll just be on like a light switch. 180 countries will have access to Spirit Rangers. And I'm so, I'm just like so happy that it's on Indigenous Peoples Day because that holiday is like, often celebrated of like the past and the traumatic past of Columbus but the fact that Spirit Rangers is coming out that's about Native families, Native youth celebrating ourselves here in the modern space like kids are the future so I'm just like really happy that it's aligning with that date because what a great way to celebrate it. Oh absolutely and will you be hosting a viewing party or how will you be tuning in? I hope so I'm hoping to go home to the reservation and watch with um watch with my tribe out there it'll be a really special day and I'll probably cry a bunch. <laughs> I can't wait for everyone to see it. Well, Chris, I'm so excited that you're here. We only have about 30 seconds left here, but if there's one thing that you want people to know about this project, what is it? This project, while I'm so proud of it being for natives, it's also not for natives too. I'm I'm excited for them to learn about us and we're welcoming them into our world and seeing us exist in the present tense. And I just am really excited and hope it inspires future Native creators and storytellers. I can't wait to see the next generation of what they create next. Carissa, thank you so much. Thank you. It is the traditional role of the Kaduk women to manage the forest lands around their villages. This included conducting controlled burns to keep the forest healthy and strong. Once colonizers arrived, this practice was outlawed for 100 years, which meant the women could no longer take care of the forests. Now, the tribal nation located in Northern California is reestablishing this role for women. Later this month, it will hold the first ever Indigenous women's treks event. One of the women leading the way is Asia Conrad. She works for the tribe's Department of Natural Resources. Welcome, Asia. Thank you for having me. Hello. Also joining us is Vicki Preston, who is the Cultural Resources Tech. And welcome to you, Vicki. Good morning. So Vicki, I want to start with you. Can you give us some of the history of Kaduk women as uh, managers of forests? Yeah, Kaduk women have always managed the, the forest the ecosystems around us. We, um, along with other Kaduk folks, you know, Kaduk men and, and all our families and all generations um, collaborate on doing burning, you know, for ceremonial purposes, but also for things like, especially for women for basket weaving and other 
um, kind of ways that um, support specific plants that are used in basque weaving or other material practices for kudu culture. And also one thing that um, women are very um, active in is, um, you know, burning places for gathering like food resources like acorns and stuff. And Asia, I understand part of your work now is to bring some of that work back. Maybe tell us about this Trex event. Yeah, so I guess um, I was actually asked to, um, to help collaborate with Vicki and Annalisa Tripp, who both work for our tribe's Department of Natural Resources. Um, and I've worked with them in the past. Um, we went to school together, actually, too, at UC Berkeley. Um, so it's super exciting to be back home now. Um, they asked me to help join in this event, and they kind of described it to me. And it was kind of like this thing that we had dreamed up long ago of just creating a space very intentionally about welcoming women into this um, this space of fire that has been so masculine, so Western oriented for so long, um, you know, around firefighting, prescribed fire, all these different things. And so I guess um, kind of our collective goals are just to create this space to empower and celebrate indigenous women that are involved in fire related work, um, which can mean a lot of things to us that's encompassing of basket weavers, um, folks that go out and gather traditional medicines, um, different things like that. Um, so that's kind of like how we went into organizing this event with that in mind, like, you know, how can, how can we create a space that really, really honors the role that women have played traditionally in fire management, as well as, you know, landscape management as a whole. Um, and, you know, what could that look like? What should that look like? And um, so, you know, we, it's something we've come into this being very thoughtful, um, uh, and it's all kind of new to us too. We're we're learning so much about um, you know how as, as we approach this, you know what's culturally relevant and responsive and inclusive of our neighbors upriver and downriver who also have um, you know really intimate relationships with fire. Um, so I guess in in some that's kind of like you know how can we really honor the role that women have played and address kind of like the historical um, you know taking of fire from our people. Um, so, you know, we're very careful. This is very, um, it's emotional on a lot of levels for folks. So that's something we're also trying to be mindful of, you know, as talking about decolonization and kind of where different people are at in their, um, in their journeys back towards, you know, traditional ways and whatnot. So if, if that answers your question. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, Vicki, let's go back to you. Maybe tell us about some of the actual programming that will take place at this event and how long it will last. Well, during the event itself, we'll be doing a lot of burning. Um, a lot of the days we'll be actually like having the whole organizational team and all the participants in um, doing the different parts of the burning itself. So that could be like the lighting to doing the weather to doing like ground support and stuff. So that's going to be one of the main things at the event for the training exchange is going to be the burning. But we're also going to have like, um, you know, like meals together. We're going to have morning briefings. So there's going to be presentations. Um, there's going to be like meals where we can all share and invite some community members in. We're going to have um, basket weavers and other cultural practitioners coming and do some, some stuff during the event. So um, and we want to be able to like share during the event with the community through social media, through um, bringing the, the schools, the local schools and stuff, we'll be having field trips and we'll be, um, uh, you know, having presentations during the, during the event. So you, we want to be able to bring the community in also because a lot of this is, ben is for and to benefit the community. So we want to make sure that we can get as many folks involved as possible in that way. And Asia, when you're talking about wanting to get as many folks involved as possible, um, where exactly are participants coming from? I understand it's a pretty diverse uh, geological area. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited. So, I mean, like you said, this is the first event of its kind. So we kind of put a call out um, and we have amazing partners that we're working with. The Nature Conservancy, um, Lainey Quinn Davidson has been helping us. And so they have contacts and folks. And so they helped us through the various networks, the tribes as well. And we were really excited to get almost 200 applications for about 45 spots. Um, and these are like really high, good quality candidates, indigenous women from all over the world. I believe we had, um, Ooh, 11 different states, 
four different countries and um, over 40 different tribes represented in our applicant pool. Um, so it was a really tough selection process. It was so hard. I could imagine. Well, as this event gets closer, we'll definitely have to follow along with all of the uh, postings, photos, and videos that you all have. Uh, Vicki and Asia, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mainstream media paid little attention to Representative-elect Mary Peltola before she won Alaska's special election last week. However, after she won the race with over 50 percent of the vote, many people started listening. Joining us to comment on the role of the media and social media in elections is John Tasuda. He's an ICT regular contributor and a partner with Navigators Global. Welcome back, John. Thanks for having me again. So I, I want to start off because the way that this special election was run was using uh, ranked choice voting. What do you think were the takeaways of using that kind of system? Um, well, so it's an interesting system. I think they'll um, got some bugs worked out. and Maybe they were kind of lucky that they got to do this special election with that process uh, before they get to the reg the general election in, in November. So it's a it's a interesting and unique process, a way, way to uh, to do elections, I would say. Um, but one of the things that, you know, it seems to uh, take a little bit of the partisanship, uh, the political partisanship out of the, the election and the candidates really had to present themselves, um, you know, in, in this process and sell themselves and not just sell their party and, and, and what that stands for. They really have to say what they stand for. And uh, I got to say, I think that that really probably helped Mary. Uh, Peltola a lot. Um, you know, there were a lot of questions, uh, despite her sort of public image, there's a lot of questions uh, about Sarah Palin and was she still authentically Alaskan, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, some of those questions in the minds of the voters got answered with this election. Uh, I mean, you can't get more authentic Alaskan than than Ms. Peltola, of course. So um, I think, you know, that that uh, really shined the light on being able to present herself as the candidate as opposed to a candidate of a party really brought that to bear. And it'll be interesting to see if that holds true again in the general election in November. You know, when uh, the late Congressman Don Young died earlier this year, we had you on the show shortly after to give your take on what his legacy was in Indian country. And what you said is that his legacy was monumental. There was so much that he helped with. If he was watching this election and saw that a Democrat, Mary Peltola, won this seat, what do you think his reaction would be? I think he would be extremely excited. I mean, he expressed that he would love for a Native person, Native Alaskan, mm -hmm. to take his place in that seat. And I don't think he cared what party. I think he really thought that it was time for a Native Alaska and to represent uh, Alaska at large. And, and that's he's got his wish. Absolutely. And, and as you mentioned in November, we'll see if she's elected for, for a full term. Um, what are your predictions on what will happen, given that um, we're now seeing Sarah Palin, who's saying, um, you know, she's contesting the ranked cho choice voting um, system. And so what do you think is going to happen? There's already been some challenges to the, the, the system, the law that was passed, putting that ranked uh, voting system in place. So I don't think those will be successful. Um, so, you know, she'll have to compete again in sort of the same process. And, um, you know, unless something dramatic changes, I, I don't know what else changes in that dynamic. It would appear um, without having seen, you know, the sort of uh, exit polling. But I would guess that Mary got a really strong turnout from Democrats, a really strong turnout from Native voters, and a lot of disaffected, disaffected uh, Republicans uh, who don't think that Sarah Palin is authentically Alaskan anymore. And so, um, you know, if she, you know, is one of the four, uh, I think that, you know, she kind of uh, pulls away votes from any other candidates as well. And so, I, you know, unless something, again, dramatically changes, I think the result could very well be the same in, in November. With Representative-elect Peltola entering the U.S. Congress very soon, that now puts um, there that now puts six Indigenous voting members of Congress. It was uh, six, and then Secretary Deb Holland, of course, left to leave the lead the Interior Department. So then it was at five. Now it's back at six. What do you think that that means for Indigenous communities overall? Well, I, obviously, I think it's great. Uh, I think Indigenous folks, uh, regardless of their political uh, party affiliation. Um, there is a, a, a authentic American as, as you can get. 
Um, and they really take to heart representing their communities and all members of the communities. Um, you know, that's part of our traditional values uh, that we hold, that uh, we hold family and community at the highest level of regard. And I think they take that with them to Congress. And that's something that's needed by a lot more folks to get elected to Congress these days, I think. We're, of course, watching uh, Representative Mark Wayne Mullen and his uh, bid for a U.S. Senate seat. Um, he just won his Senate runoff, so that means he'll be on the ballot in November. Uh, what are your takeaways from his campaign so far? Well, he appears to have a strong lead. Um, you know, Oklahoma is heavily Republican, and uh, Mark Wayne ticks a lot of boxes when it comes to uh, Oklahoma voters. Uh, he's native, uh, but he's also a veteran. Uh, he's a small businessman, and... Uh, you know, really uh, hits home on a lot of issues that Oklahoma think Oklahomans think are important. Oil and gas industry, uh, questions about national security in this country. You know, the uh, military bases are huge in Oklahoma. So I think, uh, you know, it really kind of goes into his wheelhouse and, pro and presents a lot of challenges for a Democrat uh, opposing him. So I think he'll do strongly. Well, John Tasuda, thank you so much. Thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.